Hello, my dear friends. Today we will read the memoirs of a volunteer from the Netherlands who served in the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking. The most conservative estimates show that about 40,000 volunteers from the Netherlands served in the German elite troops. On June 21, 1940, in Holland, the Corps of the SS Division Viking was created. It was the Regiment Westland. Also, the 5th Division was formed by volunteers from the Nordland and Germania regiments. The division was fighting in the USSR on the Southern Front as part of Army Group South. Let's start from the beginning. Years ago, when I was just a young boy, we used to visit very good friends of my parents who lived in the east of Holland, not far from the German border. In 1936, we went to Germany by automobile, because my parents and their friends knew a little restaurant that offered a great dish made of trout. It was a bright summer day, and when we arrived in a small German town, there was some sort of festival happening. There were swastika flags waving, banners, lights, and flowers hanging everywhere, and the small town looked adorable. And I saw groups of Hitler youth guys marching and singing, and they looked very happy, and I thought to myself what a wonderful thing it was, until my father said to his friend, Look at those kids. That's awful. They're not going to grow up into good people. I simply had no way of understanding that. My family has always tended to be anti-Nazi, but not anti-German. The moment my father said this about the young German guys who were marching and singing in that happy state of mind delighted me. I came to have pro-Nazi sympathies. These emotions grew stronger because I was in disagreement with my father frequently, which brought me into the Waffen-SS. I became the black sheep in my family, yet my mother, brother, and sisters kept writing me letters. Training Most of our commanders, squad commander, platoon commander, company commander, we didn't just like them, we respected them. If we got wet, cold, and exhausted, then we knew that our commanders would get the same thing. I remember only one non-commissioned officer we disliked. It was a corporal who mistreated the Flemings. Once on Christmas Eve, when he got drunk to the point of blackout, we wrapped him in a blanket, dragged him down the stairs, feet forward, dropped him into one of the laundry troughs, and turned on the cold water. We gave him a good kicking, but his fellows never reacted. Afterwards, he was much more respectable. The training was mostly focused on discipline. We were taught that the commander's orders must be obeyed. For example, if your commander was just an Oberschütze, who was one rank above you, it made no difference. He was still your commander. However, we never had to do something meaningless, such as jumping out of a window without prior checking its distance from the ground and so on. Yet we might have been ordered to lie down in a water-filled ditch or in blackberry bushes or to fall into melted snow. At times it turned into a contest between the will of one person and the will of all the others. It didn't mean that they wanted to break our spirit, absolutely not. It only meant that the order we were given had to be obeyed. One day we were on a training drill in a field that was flooded during a flash flood, then frozen, and then partially thawed afterwards. In other words, the perfect case for taking shelter. Initially, we each tried to stay dry by keeping our bodies weighted on our toes and palms, but as our strength ran out, we switched to elbows and knees. Finally, we came to realize the uselessness of disobeying an order and began to flop to the ground with our entire bodies. We even began to play dabbling, attempting to get on the ground closer to our non-commissioned officer and knock him down. Eventually, we succeeded, and the other non-commissioned officers who escaped being knocked down laughed at him with glee. Cleaning and tidying were a kind of cult. Being told that your room, rifle, or uniform had to be clean was to be taken quite literally. The cleaning was normally on Saturday mornings. It started with all the guys crawling on all fours to scrub the stone floors of the long corridors and stairs. After it was done, and satisfying the commander's requirements might mean two or three times of redoing the cleaning, we would start cleaning our rooms. We pushed beds and closets around, scrubbing floors and washing dust off all the slats and shelves. The windows were scrubbed with wet newspapers. The inspection came after all of this, and the results of the inspection would determine how we would spend our weekend. Not only rooms were inspected, but each soldier, his bunk, his bed, and his locker contents. The only thing that was not inspected was the soldier's knapsack where we kept our personal belongings, writing paper, pictures, letters from home, and so on. I soon came to the conclusion that it would be better to have two pairs of everything. Two toothbrushes, two hair combs, two razors, two handkerchiefs, two pairs of socks. Once during an inspection, a match was found behind a closet leg. Nothing was mentioned to us, but that night, about 11 o'clock in the evening, 
When we all had gone to sleep, we were ordered to line up with full dress uniforms and to bring out one blanket. When we lined up, four guys were ordered to hold the blanket by the corners and put a match in the center. Then we marched around for about an hour, and then we were ordered to dig a hole one meter by one meter in size, and one meter in depth, in order to have the match buried in it. On the next morning, things went on as before, as if nothing had happened. At the Bad Totes training unit, we completed an introductory course and were promoted to the rank of Standard Oberjunker. Here there was once a heated argument between one of the instructors and our Danish comrade. The argument was over the forced union between the European countries and Germany. This argument grew into something more significant than just a disagreement between two people. We all joined the debate. It became obvious that many Teutonic volunteers had a negative view of the German occupation of their countries. The feelings heated up and gesticulation was needed. That very evening, almost all of the foreign cadets stitched emblems shaped like their national flags to their left sleeve. Normally, only a few of the cadets had such emblems. There was no reaction from the instructors or officers the next day. No one complained. No one asked anything. But after a few days, the officer who took part in the dispute was moved to a front unit. Regarding the ideological cultivation, of course, I remember it well. We were ordered to study certain parts of Hitler's book Mein Kampf and prepare to answer questions for the next class. We hated it all. We had to waste a lot of our free time on something we had no particular interest in. There was also the language barrier. It would be very difficult for most of us to interpret what we read in this book, even in our own language. We didn't even know many common words and simple expressions in German. We knew the commands, we knew the German names for all the parts of our weapons and uniforms, we had no problems in town ordering a beer or a meal talking to someone local, but our vocabulary contained no political terms. We also studied Weltanschauung, philosophy and politics, in the training unit. Our instructor's name was Wiedmann. He also used Mein Kampf, but looked into this book much more deeply. Once again, we didn't like it much, but thanks to it, some interesting moments occurred. Among the eight cadets in our room was a Dutchman from the town of Nijmegen, named Franz Godart. He was already a regular SS sergeant and had the Golden German Cross. We were unsure exactly because of what he had received this award. Each evening, whenever we had to do our homework, he would find a possibility to get out into town. He would appear just before lights out, ask us what we had to do for the next day, look over his notes, and then go to bed. The following day, he would always answer all questions confidently. Our instructor could put one of us in the position of an ideological enemy, such as a communist, while he himself represented a member of the NSDAP, ready to defend the interest of the party and the fatherland. Generally, he was quick to defeat us in an ideological argument. One day, however, he told Godart to take the role of a British newspaper reporter in the discussion. Godart won the debate handily, while Wiedemann totally freaked out and looked like a complete fool. Battles at Kursk the order to march was received on July 11, 1943. We set out in the early evening, kept moving all night, and slept during the day. We tried to make ourselves look different every day, to upset the apple cart of anyone who might track our movements. Either we flaunted all our weapons, or we hid them. One day we wore gymnasterka, another day we wore tunics, the third day we wore camouflage. We even changed the identification marks of our division on the trucks. The Russian partisans had to be confused, trying to find out which units were on the march. Finally, we reached the place and deployed, splitting into small groups. When you're in that kind of combat formation, you have no idea what's going on with men on your right or left. Our company encountered a column of trucks with Wehrmacht soldiers who had apparently been pushed out of their defensive positions by the Russians. As we moved forward, we abandoned the trucks because of enemy artillery fire. We jumped to the ground and set off on foot. It was a country road, the ground was soft and sandy, which made our march, particularly with the heavy machine gun on our shoulders, very exhausting. I was out of strength when our commander overtook me and took the machine gun away from me to give me some time to rest. All along, he was urging us to move as fast as possible because there was an absolute urgency. Eventually, we took up positions abandoned by someone else, and there was a respite. The positions we occupied were very good. The trenches and dugouts had been well prepared and equipped. It must be that the Russians had attacked here with large forces and pretty suddenly, as we found many unpacked parcels and a huge amount of all sorts of equipment and supplies in the dugouts. We spent a good time picking out new socks, underwear, and other things. 
In the midst of this feast, a messenger from company headquarters appeared with the following message. Munk and his number two report to headquarters immediately. I was mad, for I had to drop all this treasure and go to the company commander's post. When we got to him, he ordered us to take up a firing position in the trench for the defense of headquarters. This was about 3 p.m. At about 5 p.m., a prisoner was brought in who said that the Russians supported by tanks would attack in the early morning of the 19th of July. And he told the truth. Before long, it became evident that this attack was pretty successful. I saw Russian infantrymen moving from right to left, right in front of my trench. I had my MG-34, an excellent machine gun, very reliable and highly accurate. My number two was a Romanian, a farmer's son. He spoke German badly, but his will to help me was above average, as was his physical strength. While any other number two could have carried two boxes of ammunition, he carried four boxes and still kept up. At that time, there was a shortage of brass in Germany, so rifle and machine gun cartridges were made of steel and then lacquered in order to prevent rusting. So, I was in position, I had my great machine gun, my excellent number two, and plenty of ammunition of poor quality. Normally, we tended to control the firing and only fire short bursts. On this occasion, however, the number of enemy soldiers moving in front of us was so considerable that firing long bursts was necessary. This resulted in the barrel overheating, and before I even had time to change the barrel, the machine gun jammed. A lacquered cartridge stuck in the red-hot barrel. While trying to fix the machine gun, I forgot to shelter and at that moment I felt as if someone had hit me on the shoulder with a hammer. I felt no pain, but fortunately I was able to move my arm. Then I heard a noise to my right and saw my number two jumping into the trench as if he was going to pick up another box of ammunition. In fact, a bullet hit him in the left temple and killed him. The shot seemed to come from somewhere to the left. While looking over there, I recognized the Russians in brown uniforms. As my machine gun failed, I fired my pistol several times in that direction and then ran away along the trench bottom. Shortly, I ran into several SS soldiers, who I recognized as staff soldiers, cooks, and intendants. They weren't true war fighters, so I shouldn't have been surprised to see that none of them had any idea what to do. Our company commander was on the ground. The guy said he was dead, but I decided to have a closer look at him. The bullet had entered his head near his left ear. It looked fatal, and I thought he was actually dead, but he moved. The guys pointed to some trench and told me they intended to use it to get to the battalion headquarters. I picked up my commander and was going to follow them, but then he managed to tell me not to go after them, but forward, toward the anti-tank unit next to us. The guys told me that the officer was feverish and paid no attention to his words. I and another Dutchman thought he was making a point. I put his arm around my shoulders and moved on, but every time he heard a gunshot he made an effort to go himself and stepped on my heels, and finally we fell to the ground. My Dutch comrade was wounded in the thigh and could hardly move on his own. The easier way was just to carry my commander, slinging him over my shoulder. It wasn't good, as my injured shoulder started to hurt, but we continued on our way. My comrade followed me, and at the same time there were several Russians following him at some distance, who were holding him at gunpoint. They were as frightened and confused as we were, and eventually a single shot was sufficient to force them to hide. At a certain moment I stopped to catch my breath. This allowed my commander to pull open his clipboard and show me the direction we were headed. I wanted to trust he was correct, though except for the three of us and the few Russians following us, there was nobody else in sight at all. We came to the end of a trench and continued our way along the top of it until I saw some trees where our commander said our anti-tank unit was. Just beyond that, we jumped into a large crater and sheltered in it. I told the Dutch guy to help me, for I was totally exhausted. Now he carried the commander, and half an hour later, a Volkswagen pulled up to get us. I was taken to a dressing station, my wound was treated, and I was told, to my relief, that the wound wasn't deep and there was no serious damage. Here I met my platoon commander once again, who told me a sad story. Almost the entire company was lost when its positions were crushed by the Russian tanks in the early morning. Afterwards, I was transported to a hospital in Nepropetrovsk. By August 23, 1943, I had recovered and was given a leave of absence home. When I arrived home, I found there a parcel with an iron cross second class. My embarrassed mother gave me my award, along with a cover letter from my company. Battles on the Dnieper Line By this time, many of the guys in our unit were foreigners, mostly Romanians. Our defensive line was along the Dnieper. The terrain was wide open, covered with bushes and small woods with sparse small groves. The Russians attempted several attacks through this area, which was favorable from their viewpoint but each time we managed to repel their attacks. 
they couldn't move at night without noise, so we didn't have much trouble. On November 2nd, 1943, we had a feeling that something must happen, because we heard the Russians singing songs and, in general, being noisy. In other words, they had drunk their vodka ration, which should have given them courage before the attack. Of course, at 6 p.m., we were informed that the attack was about to begin. I commanded the squad at that time, and I immediately sent everyone out of the dugout to the trenches. Everyone left except one Romanian man who told me that someone had grabbed his helmet and the other one remained was too small for him. He wanted to stay behind to guard the dugout. I told him everything I thought about it, handed him my helmet, and left the dugout with only a kepi on my head. Then I joined my number two, who was already close to the machine gun. The attack began, more ferocious than usual, but we repulsed it again. As always, at that moment, our artillery began to fire, cutting off the Russians under machine gun fire from retreating. This time, the shells fell quite close to us. I heard the explosions on our left, one distant from us, another one quite close at all. The third one hit the spot. It blew up right in front of us and shattered our machine gun. We were moments too late to rush to the bottom of the trench. Some huge weight seemed to push me down. My number two started swearing, shouting that the scumbags had torn his nose off. Things weren't that bad. A tiny shrapnel had pierced his nose across, and the blood was pouring out of it as from a slaughtered pig. We decided to move to the dugout so I could bandage him up. Unfortunately, I found to my surprise that I was unable to move. I thought my legs had simply fallen asleep while I was squatting. When the next shell hit, I was hurled to the bottom of the trench so hard that I scratched my face against the ground. I shouted to my comrade not to be stupid and to calm down. He helped me to get to the dugout, but already there, he said that he didn't need me, and in any case, didn't push me. Something seemed to be wrong. I couldn't feel my legs beneath, so I unbuckled my belt, unbuttoned my tunic's bottom buttons, and began to examine my back. Nothing seemed to be wrong. I pulled down my pants, examined my legs, but again nothing. I started bandaging my comrade. Then, we had a cigarette and I felt hot. I was pouring sweat. I took off my kepi and blood ran down my face. I felt the wound on my head and realized the reason my legs didn't function. After a while, I was dragged along the trench to a place where the trench was wide enough to accommodate a stretcher. Then they took me to the collection point for the wounded, where I stayed to wait for transportation to the rear. There were plenty of wounded. The Russians went on the attack again, and all the wounded men able to bear weapons returned to the trenches. The ones who remained had to take care of themselves. We were given hand grenades, automatic rifles, and were wished good luck. We realized everything. It would have required a lot of men to take us to the rear, but we had no manpower. The Russians fired at us. We started to shoot back. They threw grenades at us. We also threw grenades at them. Fortunately, the Wehrmacht units, supported by light tanks, launched an attack. We didn't lose a single wounded man, though some, including me, got new wounds. Thank God, quite light. After that, I was dragged to some dugout occupied by Wehrmacht soldiers. The bunker was deep, with a well-protected doorway and a very thick cover. There were tables and light chairs inside, a radio sounded, and it looked almost like a propaganda picture. Several prisoners were captured during our counterattack. As always, they were used to carry ammunition and to transport the wounded. We had to cross a pretty flat and open field to reach the dressing station. The enemy fired on this area, and after each burst, the captured Russians dropped the stretcher on which I was lying and looked for shelter. The guy who was on the side of my head showed more care and lowered the stretcher carefully. By this time, I had a bad headache, and the fact that they were dropping the stretcher on the ground didn't make my condition any better. I told the guy who was on the side of my legs that if he dropped me again, I would shoot him. I gave him a couple warnings. He became more careful after each warning, but before long, he dropped the stretcher again. Finally, I pulled up my pistol and fired it over his head. Things went well after that. A Spirit of Camaraderie I arrived in the town of Elvangen from the Krakow Hospital in June 4, 1944. I guess the time I lived in this town was the best time of my entire Waffen-SS service thanks to the unit I was assigned to. I found myself in the 3rd Company of the 5th Training Reserve Battalion. The officers were all afraid of our company commander. If something occurred between him and another officer, he waited until Saturday. We went to the cinema on Saturday nights. After the cinema, he would wait until the company, whose commander had displeased him in some way, would leave the cinema. We waited for a while, and then followed them. While marching, all the companies used to sing something. 
The moment we started to overtake the company ahead of us, marching faster than the guys in that company and singing a different song louder than them, our opponents would interrupt the rhythm and start singing out of sync. This meant that their commander would get in trouble for that kind of thing. In most cases, such measures were taken if there was some tension between company commanders or soldiers of different companies. There was a positive aspect to it. After such incident, the other company began to approach the training with more enthusiasm. They marched and sang better, but none of the companies was able to beat the one I served in. It's a unique experience to march in line all as one, to take part in drill training on the plats. When all the movements are so synchronized that each of them goes off with a single clear sound. Relations with civilians. Basically, when people mention the SS, they have in mind the concentration camps, the brutal murder of prisoners of war and civilians. We all know about the military police who treated people extremely badly. We know about those who killed and tortured. We know about armies that committed war crimes. But all of this doesn't mean that everyone who put on a military uniform was a beast. What makes it horrible is that when speaking about the SS, everyone is considered a scumbag, both Algemein SS and Waffen SS. Waffen SS soldiers were made up of volunteers. They were soldiers with minimal political preferences, whereas the SS Algemein was made up of many Nazi party members, not soldiers. Most of those who talk about the SS are actually meaning the Algemein specifically. We, soldiers, who fought in the Waffen SS were just soldiers. Perhaps a little above the level of the average Wehrmacht soldier, but that was probably because we were all volunteers. For example, in the village of Apolonovka, to the north of Nepropetrovsk, the Russian civilians were treated by our Dutch physician, an SS Hauptstromführer, absolutely for free. On another occasion, we were standing near the village of Lozovoya, and a rumor circulated that we would be moved to France or Italy. After a while, we got orders to build wooden sleds to help ourselves with means of transportation. We had planned ahead, our squad had to make four large sleds. We knew that an old man who lived in a local village was going to build a house for his daughter, and having only an axe, he had managed to make an ideal rectangular beam from a fallen tree trunk. We haggled with him and bought the beam for two army blankets, twenty rubles, cigarettes, and some sewing needles and flints. We had a saw, and in a moment we had made four sledges, and sold the rest of the beam to other squads. Another day, however, a Romanian, who could speak a little bit of Russian, and was used by our company as an interpreter, chuckling at us, said that the old woman who lived with that old man had come to have a talk with the company commander. According to him, she complained that her old man had been working for weeks to plane the beam, and now some soldiers from our company had taken it away. If our Untersturmfuhrer had belonged to the type of SS officers usually depicted, he would have simply shot the old woman. Instead, we got orders to report to the commander and explain our behavior. We said nothing about the blankets as they were army property, but confessed to everything else. The commander decided that we could keep the sledge, since the beam had already been sawn away, but he ordered us to give the old couple 40 additional cigarettes and 10 rubles. Here you can see the inhuman treatment of the locals by Waffen SS soldiers. We often exchanged food with the locals for their eggs, fried potatoes, and pickles. It was allowed to communicate with the locals at this level, but any sexual contact with Russian women was strictly forbidden. Following this order was not difficult, as I did not see any attractive women. As for the stature, we could only guess what was hidden under all those multiple skirts. About the Russians From our viewpoint, the Russian soldiers were considered a little more valuable than livestock to be slaughtered. They went into battle regardless of casualties. Here's an example. Once we were at the edge of a forest, then we saw the Russians pulling some sort of anti-tank gun out from behind the trees. It wasn't a large caliber gun, but it was definitely possible to fire it. There were about five Russians next to it. We saw them turning the gun around, loading it, and preparing to fire. We fired and shot them down. Another group stepped out from behind the trees. They came out in no hurry, as if it was a Sunday walk. They approached the gun. Everything was the same again. We shot them too. Another crew appeared, we shot these guys too, and then they left the gun alone. We could not make any sense of it. These men seemed to be deliberately committing suicide. The thing we were most afraid of wasn't being killed or wounded, but being captured. The Russians could behave simply like beasts. One day we got a young Russian deserter, whom we kept in our unit, as he was intelligent. He helped us and knew a lot of German words. Briefly, he was the extra pair of hands we needed. 
Sometimes at night, he went to the other side of the front and came back with a few of his fellow countrymen, whom he had managed to convince to desert. Then one morning, he didn't return. We decided that he had simply rejoined his men. A few days later, we beat the Russians back from some village. There was a tree growing in the middle of the village, where we came across our Ivan. Someone well acquainted with medicine pulled his guts out of him, all of them, and wrapped them around the tree. Attitude of Compatriots During my first leave in Holland, upon arriving at the station in my hometown of Leiden, I said goodbye to another Dutchman I had spent a lot of time with on the train. He was headed for Alkmaar, a city 65 kilometers north of Leiden. A few months later, I heard the following story. When he arrived in Alkmaar, his first thing to do was to go to the hairdresser to get himself cleaned up before meeting his parents. While he sat in the hairdresser's chair, the rebels shot him in the back with a Sten submachine gun. But I tried to avoid taking any risks. If I took a train or bus, I always leaned my back against a wall or a window, for otherwise the passengers would burn through my uniform with their cigarettes or cut it with a razor. On that first leave, I wanted to visit the family of a Dutch fellow who had died at the front, as his house was not far from Leiden. I went there by bicycle. The weather was cool, and I put on my old motorcycle jacket, a great made-to-measure black leather jacket. I imagine I looked like one of those ominous-looking Gestapo men like they are shown in the war movies. I made the long way, and then I had to carry my bicycle on my shoulder across a streetcar bridge. I was halfway across the bridge, and then someone shot at me. I dropped the bike to the ground and pulled out my pistol. Usually on vacation, we only took a bayonet with us but after listening to various stories, I decided that something more serious would be sensible. The second shot rang out. I couldn't actually see who was shooting at me or from where, so it made no sense for me to shoot back at him. Anyway, there were no more shots. Last Days of the War In early April 1945, the entire Junkerschul was relocated to the district of Todnau to join the formation of the Nibelungen Division, that's the 38th SS Grenadier Division. I was assigned to command a company of Volkssturm men, young boys and old men, who were mostly trained for the use of Faust patrons. But this new division never got into service. There were no weapons, and the unit's combat morale were very low. Nevertheless, I was still sincerely believing that Germany would win the war. Only a few days later, we sent the men from the Volkssturm back home, and the Nibelungen division was defunct. We returned to Bad Tolz, where we got orders to find our divisions and return to service. I served in the Viking Division, which was fighting heavy battles in the area around Graz City at this time. The effort, I was with three other Dutchmen in the rank of SS Startent Oberjunker, to reach our units was not without great danger. Sure, we had passes, but traveling at that moment in time was a risky thing to do. The Allies dominated the air, firing at anything that moved, even at cyclists. The expiration date of our pass documents was quickly approaching and bands of SS maniacs, not from the Waffen-SS, but from the Algemeine, were sweeping the streets, hanging and executing anyone they considered to be a deserter. I saw Waffen-SS soldiers hanging on trees and lampposts myself. But luck was with us, and on the 4th of April we came across an SS Standartenfuhrer who put us to good use. This officer had order forms personally signed by Himmler. They allowed him to do anything he wanted, during the following two weeks, we seized all possible equipment from those military units that crossed our path and stored it on farms to be used later in partisan warfare by Verwolf units. This period of comparative safety ended on April 29th. Our Standartenfuhrer reassigned us to the town of Landshut, where we met with the Gauleiter, the local Nazi leader. I was assigned to command a group of boys from the Labor Corps, all aged between 16 and 17, who were eager to join the fight so that I could train them in the use of Faust patrons. On May 1st, in the area of Egenfelden, near Wilsbeberg, I went out with my guys to the edge of the forest. We had to hold a defensive position there. Before long, we spotted a dozen American tanks moving toward us in a single column alongside a narrow road. I managed to hit the head tank, but as I realized that our situation was hopeless, I dispatched all the guys to find their way home. They cried because of the failure of their hopes. They never had a chance to taste gunpowder. Attitude to the leaders What I can say about the political leaders is that we believed everything Hitler said, and I believed that Germany would win the war until March of the year 1945. I became finally certain that the war was lost when we heard that Hitler was dead. As for Hitler himself, I considered him a true man. He was just a corporal when he earned the Iron Cross first class in World War I. That was a considerable honor back in those days. 
When he delivered his speeches at Congress and meetings, he had the ability to captivate his audience. He had the power to make us believe everything he said, and we were filled with enthusiasm. All the people I met respected Hitler and believed him, and I myself agreed with his opinion and feeling. What I can say about Himmler is that he was not a real man. He had an appearance of a man who could not be trusted, and he was certainly not a bright representative of the Aryan race of gentlemen, either in appearance or in his personality. We had the opinion that Himmler was too miserable to be in command of the Waffen-SS. Closing Word I regret deeply that I was part of a regime that set up the concentration camps and ordered the massacres, but I, my comrades, and the Germans I talked to were very unaware of this. It may sound like a flimsy argument, but it is the truth. During my last leave, my father told me that he believed the news about the extermination of Jews in concentration camps. I told him that there were many prisoners from Dachau working in the Junkerschule in Bad Tolz. They wore black and blue striped labor uniforms worked as gardeners and cleaned the roads. When we passed by, they had to stand to the side and take off their caps and nothing more. If any of us dared even try and touch one of them, they had the right to complain to their capo and it would be a penalty for one of us. They were provided with three cigarettes a day, we were provided with only two. Moreover, they started work later than we did in the morning and didn't seem exhausted. Should I have believed my father or my own eyes? Sure, I know it was all an unspeakable lie but at the time, none of us had any clue. The Soviets and the Western Allies united and won. All things badly done, all things done improperly, were blamed on the defeated. I entirely accept that Nazi Germany had to disappear, as the atrocities committed with the sanction of a government that was aware of everything cannot be forgiven. But I remember the indignation of the civilized world when Germany bombed Warsaw and Rotterdam at the beginning of the war. They called it barbarity. Nonetheless, just a few years later, the Allies used the same practice when they dropped bombs on German cities. I have no regrets about joining the Waffen-SS. I feel grateful to fate for having experienced this sense of camaraderie, and I am proud to have belonged to a people for whom loyalty to each other was inviolable. I remember the days when every European believed that communism was evil. Everyone knew about the Siberian camps for the political prisoners and the systematic cleansing that Stalin practiced on those communists who didn't fall in line. And I believed it at that time, and I believe it now, that I was right to strive against that system. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and support the channel by subscribing. Bye everyone, and see you soon.